joining us in this room and online. Thank you so much for being a part of this service. We pray that wherever you are, whatever is going on in your world, that today you will experience God's peace and his strength. There's no easy way to transition from Ukraine to the book of Ruth, but we are going to. Actually, it's a timely message series for the next week as we look at the pain of the story of Ruth, but yet how God provides in our pain. So today, if you're following along in the physical Bible, Ruth is the seventh book of the Bible in the Old Testament is right after Judges and before 1 Samuel. So you can go ahead and turn to the book of Ruth. I'm so thrilled to teach through this series for several reasons. One, you know, oftentimes in the Old Testament books, God shows up in very extraordinary ways. He shows up supernaturally, like in the burning bush, he begins to speak. That'd be odd if you saw it. He shows up as cloud by, fi- uh, by day and fire by night. He sends angels and speaks audibly and shows miraculous signs in the heavens to show that he is present. But in the book of Ruth, there is no audible voice. There's no extraordinary, visible miracle of God that he performs. But yet, undeniably, we see in the book of Ruth that God is present. God is at work. And I love this book because it It's more similar to how we engage with God. That God shows up in ordinary moments. He works through ordinary people. He works through ordinary events. The invisible hand of God is constantly at work, orchestrating every piece of our life, every part of the narrative of history. The book of Ruth isn't about a nation or a priest or a prophet. It's about one ordinary family. It's about one family and how God cares for the condition of just one family. Oftentimes, I think we live most of our lives in humdrum days, in humdrum routines of life, the usual routines of work and family and and running from practice to practice and uh, meeting needs and putting out fires of our life. It's the normal routine of our life. But Ruth will teach us that God shows up in the ordinary. He shows up in our workplaces. He shows up where we least expect him to be. Ruth will teach us that our ordinariness is not uselessness. That as lost as you might feel in the universe, as alone as you might feel in the universe, if you feel anything but spectacular, God sees you. He has a plan for you. And in fact, no matter who you are or where you are, you are right in the middle of God's providential care and of his master plan for the world. Usual stories begin like this. Usual stories begin with birth, maybe the birth of a prince or a king, moves into this incredible, long-anticipated marriage, and the death of a long-fulfilled life. It usually is birth, marriage, and death. But Ruth is quite the inverse of that. Ruth begins with a tragic death, leads to an unexpected marriage, that leads to the birth of a child. Good stories usually have a surprising ending, but Ruth has a surprising beginning. I mean, just in the first four verses of the first chapter, half of an entire family are wiped out. And you're beginning to wonder, what is happening in this story? Another reason I think Ruth is so fascinating is that it's the reversal of the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. In the Abrahamic covenant, God chooses Abraham, one man, and out of him creates a nation, the nation of Israel. The covenant of Abraham is that through Israel, God will bless the world. God will bless the outside world. So in the Abrahamic covenant, Israel blesses the world. But in Ruth, it's the inverse. It's not Israel who blesses the world. It's the outsider who comes into Israel and blesses this nation. And then God will use her seed to bless the world. God chooses a woman by the name of Ruth, an outsider, a Moabite, as an outsider possibly could be from the fringes of society, chooses Ruth and uses Ruth to bless the world. He uses an outsider to bless the insider. Can I just pause and tell you that if the circle of people in your life are all insiders, If they look like you, talk like you, believe just like you do, watch the same news channels as you do. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on that. If they're just like you, your circle may be comfortable, but it's too small. It's too small. God often gives us what we need in our life through the lives of those who are unlike us. 
That's where stories are shared. That's where different perspectives that stretch us and grow us are shared. And God often deposits in our life what we need from those that we might least expect it. So here in the book of Ruth, God expands the story of redemption, not only to the outsider, but through the outsider. He expands this narrative, the story of redemption, not just to the outsider, but through the outsider. Ruth is a book of pain. You can't run from it. You can't run from the brokenness and the injustice and the vulnerability of those most at risk. You hear about the losses of loved ones, the lost lives, barrenness. It's a story of pain that you just can't avoid. You can't put it on the back burner. You can't excuse pain as just some inconvenience of life. No, you are dealt with this incredible pain of this family and how God engages in the story of a family's pain. If you're going through a season of pain, this book is for you. This story has you in it. If you're bitter towards God, you are in this story. If you've asked the question of why me, why now, why this, all of those why questions, you're in the story of Ruth. Maybe you're not asking the questions of why, or maybe you're not even in a season of pain. But you refuse to turn a blind eye to pain. You too are in the story. You want to be used by God to bring comfort, to bring strength to those in need. You are in the story of Ruth. In the book of Ruth, the hero is actually not Ruth. It's not Naomi, and it's not even Boaz. The hero is single-handedly God himself. God is the hero. This story tells us that as bleak as it might be, as lonely, as chaotic, as painful as the world might be, God is at work. God always has his people, and God will always carry out his purposes. God is not surprised by the affairs of the world. God is not surprised by the famine, pandemic, or wars in the world. He has his purpose, and his purposes will not be thwarted. He continues a story of redemption. It is a story about God. His providence is sovereign to his care for people. Ruth is not just a sweet interlude of romanticism. And a beautiful story of Boaz and Ruth, tucked away in the Old Testament. Ruth is theologically rich and deep. Ruth makes a significant contribution in the way we view God, in the way we know God and trust him. The book of Ruth invites us to trust God when we don't understand his ways. To trust God when life isn't good. To trust him in our pain. To lean in and see that he is at work even when we cannot see. So join us for the next six weeks as we navigate through this incredible book, the book of Ruth. So let's jump in. Ruth chapter 1 begins like this. It says, during the time of the judges, there was a famine in the land. A man left Bethlehem in Judah with his wife and two sons to stay in the territory of Moab for a while. The man's name was Elimelech and his wife's name was Naomi. The names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judah. They entered the fields of Moab and settled there. They went for a while and they settled in Moab. We're historically situated in the story during the time of the judges. The time of the judges. And in fact, this is actually where the pain of the story begins. It's the time of the judges. A little bit of Israel's history is that the period of the judges was actually one of the darkest times in Israel's history. It's the period between the death of Joshua and the birth of Samuel. About 350 plus years of utter chaos. See, by now, the Israelites have passed through the Exodus. They've actually come to Canaan, the promised land. But they made this fatal mistake of not getting rid of all the idols and false worshipers in Canaan. So for three plus centuries, they begin to intermingle with false gods and false worship. The book of Judges ends by saying that without a king in the land, people did what seemed right to them. Whatever they saw fit with their own eyes, they just did it. 
They didn't honor God. They turned away from him to idols and they did what was right in their own eyes. And as a result, the period of the judges is teeming with foreign invasions and civil war, witchcraft, idolatry, unchecked lawlessness. And this is where the story begins. To add to this complicated beginning, not only is it the time of the judges, it is a time of famine in the land. Famine in the land. A lack of food and normal day-to-day -day resources needed for a family to survive. It's a time of famine. Now this famine could be just a natural disaster that came, or likely it could be the very judgment of God. God had told the Israelites in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, if you leave worship of the true one God and turn to idol worship, I may send foreign nations to, to take over, or I may withhold rain and cause famine to come on your land. And here in this season, they're experiencing famine. They've turned away from God and are experiencing a season of famine and devastation. The word Bethlehem means the house of bread. And the word Elimelech means God is my king. Or the Lord is my king. What do you do when Bethlehem, the house of bread, has run out of bread? Well, Elimelech decided to run out of Bethlehem. This was an easy choice by any means. He sees the condition that he and his family are in. And he says, we got to go somewhere where we can find food to eat. Maybe this is kind of like what some families in Ukraine are feeling. Do we stay or do we leave? Do we find refuge? What do we do as a resort to take care of our family? And here Elimelech decided to go to Moab. Let me find bread for my family somewhere and find provision during this time of family, famine. So he leaves Bethlehem and goes to Moab. Here's a picture of Bethlehem and, and Moab, and they're not that far apart. They're only about seven to ten days of journey if you were to go from Bethlehem to Moab, and this is the journey that they return on. This is an incredible mountainous range. It would take about seven to ten days. Moab is on the eastern side of the Dead Sea. So as we look at the map, it's like, oh, sure, he goes to Moab. That's the reasonable close proximity of a place he can go to. But the truth is that this is the last place that an Israeli family should be in. They should not be in Moab. It's not an acceptable ordeal as Elimelech and his family go to Moab. Moab and Israel have had this strange relationship for many, many years. Sodom and Gomorrah were in Moab. Moab was birthed as a nation through an incestuous encounter between Lot and his oldest daughter. If you remember that story. This is a weird, inappropriate side of the family you never went to visit. You pretend like they didn't exist. You don't want to tell anybody you're connected to them. You don't go to Moab. Actually, after the first service, someone said, you know what Moab means in military terms? I said, no. He said, mother of all bombs. I said, I think that's probably too soon to talk about that. But, but it is not an ideal place to be in. As Israel was camping around Moab as they left Egypt... We're told that Moabite women came and seduced Israeli men, leading them to immorality and idolatry. And that caused the lives of thousands of Israeli men who died in God's judgment. You don't go to Moab, and you particularly don't involve yourself with Moabite women. This is the backstory that we're reading. But now, Elimelech, his wife Naomi, and their two sons had to Moab. Imagine what Naomi was thinking as she's plodding into Moab through the dusty, mountainous roads that lead there. She's thinking, Bethlehem, huh? The house of bread? It doesn't seem like it. The chosen people, the promised land? It sure does not feel like it. But they go to Moab and begin to settle there. But the famine was only the beginning of trouble for this family. As they got to Moab, notice what happens. Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died. And she was left without her two sons. Her sons took Moabite women as their wives. One was named Orpah and the second was named Ruth. They get to Moab and what happens? Elimelech, the dad in the family, the husband of Naomi, dies. And this is a huge deal in a patriarchal society. Elimelech dies. Naomi becomes a 
widow. She joins the lowest rank of people in her society. She is both a widow and a foreigner. She's a widow and a foreigner. In ancient times, to become a widow meant to become destitute, to be left with nothing. You were left out of the inheritance of a family if you were a widow. God graciously had provided strict rules of how people were to take care of widows and provide for them and not do injustice towards them. But oftentimes, societies, when they did what was right in their own eyes, treated widows harshly, left them without a voice and without protection. And here, Naomi is left without a voice, without guardianship and protection. Do you know that today in the world, nine out of ten women will spend some time in widowhood. Nine out of ten women will spend some season in widowhood. In fact, one out of two women over the age of 65 will outlive their husbands by 15 years. 15 years. Just a few weeks ago, I did a funeral for a 41-year-old man in Houston who left behind a widow and three children. A couple of weeks ago, we had a funeral in here for a 43-year-old young man who left behind a widow and young children. It's a hard thing. And I know that there are many sisters of you here at Bentry who have lost your husband too soon. And you've been going through the pain of trying to get used to this new normal that you will never get used to. I want you to know we love you. I pray for you often. We think about you. As a church community, we surround you. We love you. We are committed to doing whatever it takes for your flourishment, for your well-being. You are not alone. We love you. We care deeply about you. See, what happens in the Bible through the story of Naomi, a widow, or any other widow in the Bible, is that God does not exile the widow to the fringes of the Bible or the fringes of society, or the fringes of history. No, rather, he makes the widow a central part in the story of redemption. He includes her, he highlights her, he redeems, he works through widows. God embraces you, he loves you, he has a plan for you, he's not done with you, he puts you in the center of his plan because he is crazy about you, to protect you, to guard and provide for you. Naomi becomes a widow. She joins the lowest rank in her society. But she's got one security left. She acknowledges she's lost her husband. But guess what? I still got two boys. And boys meant everything. Sorry, girls. Boys meant everything in that time. She's got two sons. So she's thinking, I can just get them married and have some grandkids and hopefully some grand boys. And I'll be just fine. So if my boys can just get married... I can have grandkids and restore my dignity and worth and value in life. So she looks at the prospect of two weddings to mitigate her sorrow. She knows that Moabite woman is not what she wants in her home, but she's left without any option. So she gives her sons to be married to Ruth and Orpah. The two Moabite women come into Naomi's family. The outsiders join the insiders. Naomi, I imagine just like most grandmas are looking at the clock, thank you for getting married, but we need some grandbabies. When are you going to get some kids? Grandkids are God's blessing to parents for putting up with their own kids, right? This is what Naomi's thinking. I need some grandbabies. But 10 years go by and there are no grandkids. Certainly no grandsons. Ruth and Orpah are barren. Malon and Killian are unable to produce kids. This adds the pain and the tragedy of Naomi's sorrow. But it doesn't stop there. It actually gets even worse. Look at the rest of chapter, verse 4. After they lived in Moab about 10 years, both Malon and Kilian also died. And the women, meaning Naomi, was left without her two children and without her husband. She's left without Without sons and without husbands, without any male in her family, and no way to get more males in her family. Naomi isn't just at the bottom of the barrel. The barrel has literally fallen on her with the full force of finality and despair. She is hit rock bottom. She has no hope left, no potential left, no possibilities left. She has come to grasp the fact that she'll always be without. 
In a sense, Naomi is the female Job who's lost it all. She is the female Job. And in some ways, she's got it worse than Job. She's a lonely widow living in a foreign land, living in a male-dominated society without the protection of her husband or sons. She's got nothing to live for. So what does she do? In this hopeless situation, she hears some good news. And the next verse goes on to say that she and her daughters-in-law set out to return from the territory of Moab. Why? Because she had heard in Moab that the Lord had paid attention to his people. That he has paid attention to his people's need by providing them food. So she left the place where she had been living, accompanied by her two daughters-in-law, and traveled along the road leading back to the land of Judah. So while they're stuck in Moab, she hears news, good news, that God has paid attention to his people and has provided bread. The famine is over. The famine hasn't lasted long, hasn't lasted forever, rather. God has paid attention. And this is where you begin to see the sign of God's grace into Naomi's life. God visited his people. That's a little phrase there. God visited Bethlehem. God saw the condition of his people and paid attention. The word picture is there of a physician who makes an at-home visit to a patient in need. He sees the need. He conditions. He sees the condition of the people. And he doesn't turn a blind eye. He pays attention. And I want you to know that in the midst of your pain, God sees you. He pays attention to you. He hears your cries. He sees your tears. He feels what you feel. He pays attention. We don't have a God who is distant from us. We don't have a God who is aloof from us, who can't relate to our pain. No, no, no. He hears and he pays attention. He visits us in our pain. And you know I'm coming back to this in a few weeks, but this would not be the last time God visited Bethlehem. Because God will ultimately show up in Bethlehem, not as a visitor, but as Emmanuel, a permanent resident, to be with us in our pain forever. So they hear God visits Bethlehem. He paid attention. So they set out to Bethlehem. And we're going to fast forward through some of the story and come back to next week, where next week we're going to look at the conversation of Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah, and the turnkey decision that Ruth makes against all logic to cling to Naomi and go back to Bethlehem, that she would now be the foreigner going back to Bethlehem. We're going to talk about that next week, so you got to come back. <laughs> but Naomi and Ruth ended up going back to Bethlehem. As they head back to Bethlehem, notice what happens, verse 19. The two of them traveled until they came to Bethlehem. When they entered Bethlehem, the whole town was excited about their arrival. And the local women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, she answered, for the Almighty has made me very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has opposed me, and the Lord Almighty has afflicted me? I imagine the, low, the, the road out of Moab was difficult. It was not a Kodak moment. It was a Kleenex moment as these women were bound together by love and tragedy. But the road into Bethlehem was even more difficult. Imagine what Naomi felt coming into Bethlehem, the place she never wanted to leave. Maybe she saw where she grew up and it's not there anymore. It's been devastated by famine. Maybe she saw where her and Elimelech met. She looks beside her, and he's not there. She sees where her sons grew up, but they too are no longer there. I imagine she's filled with so many what-ifs and regrets. What if we had stayed? What if we just had enough faith to stay and trust God in Bethlehem? What if we came back sooner? What if we didn't go to Moab? Maybe we went to somewhere else. All of the questions of what ifs, she's filled with raging emotions. She comes back to Bethlehem after 10 plus years. As she enters Bethlehem, the people in her town, mainly women, because men would be out working in the fields, but the women that were home and working there spots Naomi. Bethlehem is a pretty small town. Everybody knew everybody. 
So they see Naomi and they're looking from a distance thinking, is that who we think she is? Is that Naomi? It's been 10 years and it hasn't been an easy 10 years for Naomi. It's been a hard 10 years. Naomi's face would have been ridden with expressions of tragedy, toil, and hardship. She's been walking on foot for 10 days. But the deeper sorrow in her heart would have been bleeding through her face. The people in the town look at her and notice, well, that maybe can be Naomi because the limit, like her husband, is no longer with her. If this Naomi, where are her boys? Where's Malon and Kilion? That can't be Naomi because why is a Moabite woman with her? Who's that young lady? Why is she coming to Bethlehem with a Moabite? So they go up to her and ask her, are you Naomi? Is it really you, Naomi? Not only did they not recognize her, Naomi has stopped recognizing her. They call her Naomi and she protests and says, no, 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 don't call me Naomi. In Hebrew custom, your name meant everything about you, it defined you. And the name Naomi means pleasant and lovely. Naomi has gone through so much pain that she no longer wants to be recognized by her own name. That's what pain does, isn't it? It not only changes how we feel, it changes how we see ourselves. I'm not true to that name. So she says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. I'm not pleasant nor lovely, but I am bitter. Bitter towards God, bitter towards life. I'm bitter, call me Mara. Naomi, quote unquote, was woke. She did not have room for small talk. (laughs) She was not gonna just stir up some small conversation with old neighbors. She was authentic, wasn't she? She was raw. I think if I was Naomi, I think if you were Naomi and we came in town after 10 years and saw some old neighbors, I think we would put a facade. We would wear our emotional mask and pretend like everything's okay. Oh, it's so good to see you. I've missed you. I'm not as bad as I look. Let me just freshen up. Let's gather for tea or coffee and let's have some chit chat time and get to know each other again. No, 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 Naomi is not pretending to be okay. She's not hiding her cards. She's letting her sorrow flow right out of her. She's saying to these women, I went away full, but I'm coming empty. Lost my sons, lost my husbands, have no grandkids. Ruth is there with her, but in that custom, they were both empty. Two widows walking side by side full of pain. And sorrow. She even says, the Lord has opposed me. He's afflicted me. (coughs) The original language is this picture of God calling Ruth into the courtroom. And she feels like God himself has testified (coughs) against her. It's God who's paying attention to Bethlehem. But she feels like God has afflicted her and forgotten her something so raw about this authenticity and something admirable, something beautiful, but not just pretending to be okay. She says it as it is and opens our heart. And I think this is something we need to learn, church. See, in times of pain, in times of sorrow, offer to God and to each other your real self rather than your pretend self. Offer to God in the pain you're in. Offer to him. You don't have to hide it. He knows. Offer yourself your real self, not your pretend self. And offer to each other your real self, not your pretend self. Sometimes we're okay offering to God our real self, but we hide our real self from one another. I can't talk about this in a small group. I can't talk about it with a pastor. I can't even tell my own family about it. But Naomi's story invites us to lament, and that's okay. To grieve, and that's okay. To grieve with people, which is totally okay. There was a whole book in the Bible called Lamentations. Because it's news that lamenting can be worship. Grieving with hope can be worship. Here Naomi comes to town, and she pours out her heart to people. She doesn't hide or veil her pain. She expresses it honestly and authentically. This week, I want to give you some homework. Maybe sometime this week, get by yourself and begin to 
write down on a piece of paper where your pain comes from. Sometimes we feel overwhelmed by pain, but we don't know why it's there or where it came from or even when it came. We don't know what caused it or who caused it. Maybe we do, but it's been so repressed. Write down where your pain comes from. Where did it stem from? And during the next week, six weeks, we're going to offer to God the particulars of our pain. Not just the general pain. We're going to voice our pain to God. We're going to voice just like Naomi did. Here is where I feel empty, God. I used to be full. I used to have full of aspirations and dreams and desires and relationships. But here is the emptiness of my life. Write it down. We love stories where you start empty and become full, but oftentimes the reality of our life is we start full and now we're empty. Where does your pain come from? Note it. Now let's offer it to God because I believe with all my heart over the next few weeks, God's going to meet you in your pain. He's going to pay attention. He's going to see you as you are. He already does. And you're going to experience God's provision in the middle of your pain pain. Naomi does something really beautiful here. She calls God by two Hebrew words, two Hebrew words to show us what she really feels about God. And it's what we often feel about God in our pain. She says, don't call me Naomi, call me Maram. She answered, for the Almighty has made me very bitter. The Almighty has made me bitter. The word Almighty there is the Hebrew word Shaddai. And it means God who is sovereign, the God who is in control. And here, in the midst of Naomi's pain, it's actually amazing. She still acknowledges the sovereignty of God. She still acknowledges that he is in control. He is all powerful. Her story has led to bitterness, but not disbelief. She still believes in God. She says, Almighty has made me bitter. I went away full, but the Lord brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord, capitalized Lord, has opposed me? And the Almighty has afflicted me. Almighty is Shaddai, God who is powerful and sovereign, but Lord is the Hebrew word Yahweh. This is the covenant name of God, the personal name of God, the way God reveals himself to us in relationship. And here in a sense is what Naomi says, I believe God is great. I believe he's almighty. He is El Shaddai. He is sovereign. He is great and powerful. But in the way he has related to me, he hasn't been good to me. He hasn't been kind. He has afflicted me. Here's what Naomi is saying that we say oftentimes, or at least feel oftentimes. In times of pain, we are prone to believe that God is great, but not so good. He is great, but not good. Maybe you feel that way. Maybe that's the way you feel about God right now. That's okay. Naomi is in the boat with you. You're sovereign. You're in control. You're great. But when I look around me, I don't see so much of the goodness of God. I face that sometimes too. You know what I go to when I face a sense of doubting God's goodness? I go to the statement that stuck with me for many years. Simply this, um, that the goodness of God is ultimately defined by the cross of Jesus, not by our own circumstances. When we look to define the goodness of God, the starting point is not around you or within you. It's to look back at the cross of Jesus that we just celebrated in communion. And God has proven his goodness at the cross. So yes, look to your circumstances and be honest about what you're going through. But ultimately, God's goodness is proven at the cross of Jesus. See, we have a benefit that Naomi didn't have. She lived on the before side of the cross. We live on the after side of the cross. We have seen that a great God became good for us. In taking on our pain, taking on our sin, taking on our brokenness. Look, bad things have only happened to one good person. One who was perfectly good, and that's Jesus. And he volunteered to let it happen to him. He willingly laid his life down on the cross for you to show you that he is good and he is great. So we look to the cross to define God's goodness. And we look at our circumstances through the filter of the cross. We don't avoid our circumstances. We don't avoid the pain in our world. No, we look through the fullness of the cross, through the filter at the cross. And that defines God's love, that defines his goodness. 
Many of you know an incredible member of our church by the name of Nancy Wozniak. Nancy and Paul are some of the most amazing people. They've been a part of Bentry for 15 plus years, and Nancy began to have some symptoms back in 2020, and last year, February of last year, 2021, she was diagnosed with ALS. ALS is a rapidly progressing neurodegenerative disease that attacks the brain and the body. It's one of the worst illnesses out there. And it began to attack her brain and her body pretty quickly. I met Nancy, I think my third week here at Bentry last year, and she rode in with her motorized wheelchair. She was so excited to see me, and we had an amazing conversation. She was so full of life and joy. She was such a pleasant person to meet and to be around. But over the last several months, her health began to deteriorate pretty quickly. She lost movement of her bones and her muscles, and she was unable to speak, unable to talk and communicate verbally. She couldn't embrace her kids, her husband. And one week ago, Nancy passed away and went home to be with Jesus. I got to see her about a month and a half ago. And this is us together. Last time I saw her, which was a month and a half ago, and she couldn't talk, she couldn't walk, but she could smile. Her smile was so wide and bright and contagious. She was still full of joy, still full of life, and she could not walk. Nancy, because she couldn't talk verbally, she had the ability, though, through the gift of technology, with her eye movement, to look at certain letters on a tablet, and it would type out what you're saying. It was mind-blowing. I was like, Nancy, this is a supernatural miracle. How are you doing this? She could literally look at certain words on a keyboard, and then it would click, click, click. So we actually had a lovely conversation during this time. She could, through her eye movement, communicate what she was trying to say. And in our time together, she had this one statement. She kept typing with her eye. And here's what she said. Here's a video of just a quick sentence that she kept saying over and over again. Still good. Say it again, Nancy. God is still good. Yes. God is still good. That's what she felt. That's what she said. That's what she lived by. I can't walk. I can't embrace my loved ones. I can't type with my fingers. I can't do many things, but I can say this. God is still good. Even in this condition, he is good. Even in my circumstances, he is still good. Nancy had a deep view of God, a deep abiding trust in God, not dependent on our circumstances, but dependent on the cross depending on the person of Jesus, and she could say, he is still good. Oh, may we be all like that. God is still good, even in our pain. Naomi and Ruth are on the journey back to Bethlehem. And so far, Naomi has come across, in every journey, dead ends. She's come across one dead end after another. She loved her home in Bethlehem, But then famine struck. It was a dead end. They went to Moab. And in Moab, she had a full stomach, but it left her with an empty home. Dead end. Now she's on the way back to Bethlehem, still not having any prospects, no future as she can see it. She thinks it's probably still going to be a dead end, but at least God has paid attention. A life, a journey of dead ends. Maybe that's where you're at today. When you look at your home, your family, your marriage, your singleness, your career, your relationships, your finances, you're looking at it and saying, this is a journey of dead ends. How can I survive? How can I keep going in my pain? I feel like quitting. Maybe God himself has turned against me. You see the story of dead ends. But at the end of Ruth chapter 1, there is this glimmer of hope. It's like the narrator, though Naomi and Ruth don't see it yet, he's saying things that are about to turn. And here is how Ruth chapter 1 ends. So Naomi came back into the territory of Moab, from Moab with her daughter-in-law Ruth, the Moabitess. They arrived in Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. They got there just in time at the beginning of harvest. This is a way of the scripture writer to say the beginning of the harvest would be the beginning of our hope. 
God was about to work. God was about to move on her behalf. God would restore. God would meet her in her pain. Oh, she didn't know it. But it was the beginning of harvest. The beginning of hope. So today, if you're in a dead-end situation, here's what I want you to walk away with today. I want you to know that though you cannot see, though you cannot see, even when you cannot see, God is at work creating doorways in our dead ends. That's almighty God. He creates doorways in our dead ends. God can still work a miracle. He can still meet you where you are. The story isn't over just like it wasn't over for Naomi. And I'm not saying your pain pain will go away, that suddenly everything will go back to normal. What I'm saying is that God will meet you right where you are. And when he meets you, there's always a doorway of hope. There's always a beginning of harvest. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that if you're in the story, the story is never over. The story is never over. For someone today, they need to know the story is far from over. You're a God who creates doorways in our dead ends. You meet us not beyond our pain, but in our pain. You come to us as hard as life has been. God, as doubtful as we have been, as bitter as we have grown, you still show us your goodness. So today, Jesus, will you fix our eyes on the cross of Jesus, where you have proven that you are great and you are good. Naomi is going to see that not only are you great, but you are also good. So fix our eyes on Jesus, the definition of love, provision, goodness, and hope. We thank you that God provides in our pain. So we offer our pain to you in its rawness, in its realness. Help us to stop pretending and reach out to one another. Reach out to you, God, and cry out to you with the pain of brokenness. We offer our real self to you, knowing that when we do, you meet us right there. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Praise God for his word.